Okay, we're back. We're live. The movie show. Uh, me and George Kaysen here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm going to talk about uh, Jali and Wallabog, which is a, a city in the uh, Punjab area of India to the northwest of India, where uh, in April of 1919, there was a horrendous massacre under the command of uh, General O'Dwyer. O'Dwyer caused his troops to fire upon um, thousands of uh, unarmed uh, Indian people who were celebrating some kind of festival that day. And uh, he killed thousands of thousands of people in cold blood. And this movie is a true story uh, about that and what followed that. George, um, how did you like the movie in general? I think it was a very good movie. It was, as you said, it was re a, a real story, and it was the acting was superb. Vic or Vicky Koshal, who's a, a, a Bollywood actor, he was excellent. Um, and then his uh, beautiful Indian girlfriend, deaf mute Reshma, uh, what was her name? Uh, Benita Santu. She was good. She didn't have much in there, but it was you show the the feeling between them, and we'll discuss what happened to her in the massacre. And then um, Amit. Parashar, that was Bandhu Singh, that was the, uh, he was the leader of the Indian, one of the Indian uh, movements for independence. So, yeah, it was a good movie. Um, like some of the other movies we have seen, it's broken up. It's not contiguous. It shows you earlier period, later period, it just bounces back and forth. And that makes it a strong, a strong movie. So you have to think. So yeah. a very good movie. Um, we'll get into the particulars as you wish. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, before I forget, the name of the movie is Sar Udam. And that is the name of the individual uh, who is the hero of the movie. And the villain, uh, at least uh, according to the British, um, uh, who later uh, executed uh, an assassination of uh, General O'Dwyer and some of his lieutenants in London 20 years later. It's quite remarkable, uh, the story of how he held on to that, never let it go, dedicated his life to assassinating this man uh, in a way that would have the most significant historical effect on people. 20 years he waited for the right moment. Um, so what's interesting about the movie is that it's not a Bollywood movie at all. It is a serious um, film and it is close to being a documentary in the sense that it, it uh, portends to follow, pretends to follow uh, what happened in those 20 years. Uh, what's, I, I guess to me, most remarkable about it is uh, you know that at some point in the movie, they're going to have to show you the massacre. And when they do, it's like three quarters away into the movie. When they do, it is just as bad as you ever might imagine. It is a masterwork of, of film uh, for them to show you what happened in this square. But let's talk about him. Uh, he's, uh, of course, um, you know, dedicated uh, comes from the what lower class, mm -hmm. um, is a revolutionary. His friends are revolutionaries, and in um, you know in in the in the nineteen nineteen period there, I guess it was uh, after the First World War, uh, where the Indians fought for the British, and died by the by the many many thousands for the British. Um, nevertheless, the British were very hard on them in India. You know, we forget how brutal uh, colonialization was, colonialism, and it was quite brutal in India. We forget because now everything is, uh, you know, independent and India is a successful country, although it took a lot of hits in COVID. Um, but we, we don't remember exactly how tough the British were. Tough is the wrong word, it's brutal. This was a complete and unadulterated atrocity a major atrocity in world history that so many thousands of unarmed men, women, and children should be shot down in their tracks. And when they fell, you know, dismembered by rifle bullets, um, the British troops went and shot them again. 
Yeah. Um, it was horrible. So what, what about Saro Hudam? What motivated him? Uh, what was, you know, how did he spend that 20 years in reacting to the massacre and, and then in ultimately planning and executing an, an assassination of the general who uh, commanded the massacre? He was he was uh, sleeping with, during at this when this massacre occurred, and one of his close friends came mortally wounded to where he was re his residence, and and he saw him and he told him before he died what had happened right, and immediately Sardar Udam went to the site which was the, the former garden that was where the, this massacre took place right, and started to see all these dead bodies and people injured. So he started on this little cart, taking people to a hospital there to try to save their lives. And he, one after, there were only two or three people that were doing this, you know, but um, uh, so, he, and then he held on to this. Now he, as an aside, his mother had died young and, and, and he was with he was raised by in an orphanage with his brother and his parents, you know, had died young. So he was had a tough life, right? But as I said, he had this girlfriend, you know, um, deaf mute girlfriend, beautiful Indian woman. I mean, she's played by a Welsh actress of Indian um, heritage. And 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 uh, so then at the massacre, she I think she died too, but they don't really show you. I think they show her. No, oh, I, I think they make it clear enough that she died. She died, right? Uh, she might have been still alive when he found her, or but only barely. Right. And exactly. that's the last time you see her in the movie. So, it's a reasonable assumption is that she died. Now, what he did, the, the the British authorities, because he was a revolutionary, they had a they had an eye on him, right? In, in India, right? They had him on a list or something. But he was able to escape uh, through the Himalayas into Russia. They show all the snow scenes in, in Russia, where he finally gets himself to England, to London, right? Under an assumed name, he's got all these different passports of different five or six different names. So he was able to get him in, and they've they lost him. They I mean they did they didn't know where he was, right? And he started working in a in a as a welder. First he started working as a salesman. He meets up with um, Michael O'Dwyer, who was who was the lieutenant governor of Punjab. There's a the general was Di, Dyer and and Michael O'Dwyer. So so he he meets yes. up with him. And he, he becomes his say he's selling things and he he, he sort of spies on, on Michael O'Dwyer, you know, all the things he's doing. And well, he, he gets into his service. He works in his house. Exactly. He helps him on everything. He's with him just feet away. And you say to yourself, why isn't he assassinating him now? And the answer is, George, because he's he's learning all about uh, Michael O'Dwyer, what his insensitivity toward what he did. I mean, he, 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 he ordered General Dyer to shoot these people. And, and just another aside, that part, that place where it is, there was only one entrance and one exit. It, it used to be a park, but it was the, the greenery wasn't there. And you had 20,000 people and they couldn't even get out because it was like there was only one entrance. And that's where the soldiers came. Well, and, they were locked in. They, they were locked in. They couldn't get out. They, there was no other exit. So, so the, the soldiers came to that only entrance and exit, and started shooting from there and blocked it. Wouldn't let them out. Right. So they just came. and then after they were dying, they shot them again. Now, so the thing is, he wanted to learn exactly the. the I mean, the, uh, you know, Uda, uh, Sadat Unda wanted to learn everything about. So he learns the whole thing about. Um, uh, Michael O'Dwyer, who was the lieutenant uh, governor of Punjab, but that ordered the massacre, right? And then he, you know, he's thinking, he's got a gun, he's thinking of shooting him right then and there. But I think what he wanted, he wanted to do it in a public place and where there's a lot of people around, right? Similar to what happened, you know, with the massacre in, in Amitsar. So basically, he holds off, he holds off, and then he takes a gun and he puts it in a book, right? He cuts the uh, the outline of the gun and puts it in the in a book, and he goes to this thing where where um, uh, Michael O'Dwyer 
is, is talking about white man's burden and how he had to put fear in the Indians. Um, you know, they were all unarmed. He was giving a speech. Yeah, it was it was it was uh, it was basically uh, children and women and you know and all all backgrounds. I mean, Sikhs, Hindus, even Christians. You know, they're all there at this. Now there were two Indian revolutionaries who had been arrested, uh, but hadn't really done anything. So they were also. This is what why they they had the rally. You know, to just give support. So basically, uh, so he finally gets to London, and he. He's working in, as you said, he's, he ends up, he's a salesman. Then he's working in a weld shop. Then he's working for Michael O'Dwyer as his servant. So he learns all about uh, Michael O'Dwyer and how horrible Michael O'Dwyer is and his racism and, you know, put, wanted to put fear in these people. That's why he ordered it. So finally, yes, he goes to this public place where Michael O'Dwyer is talking and he shoots him, right? And then you see how the British authorities treat, how brutal they treat him, you know. Um, and and at the end, you know, as it goes on, finally the the the, the prosecutor or the, the the detective wants to understand the whole thing, so he finally opens up. Mike Sodar Udam opens up and tells this detective the whole story about what happened, how he had to save these people on this cart. And 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 he learned he had learned from working for O'Dwyer, right? Exactly where O'Dwyer was coming from. What was his modus operandi? Put fear in these Indians, right? Kill kill to put fear in the whole country. And this was in Amisar um, in Punjab, right? And it was at this um, park that you mentioned. Yeah, then yeah. So yeah, there's a there's a picture of Punjab. Uh, it's uh, near the border of Pakistan, up in the northwest corner of India. Uh, Punjab is a, we, we've heard that name before. I mean, it's a significant uh, location in India. And this took place in a small city within Punjab uh, called um, Jal Jalian Jalian Wallabag Jalian Wallabag. That's the park. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. It was, it was well, bog, little, bog must mean park. Is that yeah? Yeah. yeah. And, and it was this, fam, this family who had previously been very wealthy in that in that neighborhood, like hundreds of years ago, that had set up this park greenery. But there was no more greenery in 1919. It was just a, you know, barren. You know, but it was all as I said, locked in. There was only one entrance and one exit. So, so that was a perfect place to. I mean, if you want to kill people, you can't let them out. There's no way out. No, that was intentional. It was not, um, you know, a mistake or anything. Um, Dwyer, I guess, the general who stood there while his men, including some Indian men, uh, were shooting rifles into these unarmed people um, and who, who were being, you know, maimed, I mean, and dismembered because rifle bullets, these are military rifles and a uh, military rifle with these big cartridges, they'll wreck you. And uh, and the, the the people who were wounded were badly wounded, and it was it was really striking um, how uh, Sardar Udam took them in this little cart, stacking them up one on top of the other uh, when they were dying or dead went to this hospital where they could re receive very little help, and where most of them actually died, including his girlfriend. Yeah, that was um, there was there was no uh, antibiotics in 1919, so if you get an infection from those wounds, you're dead. You yeah, know, and it wasn't you know that clean. I mean, this is this is a developing country at best at the time, but they were. Don't you think it gave us an insight into the Indian character, into his character? He was clearly a hero and trying to do the right thing all the way. And he felt that assassinating this guy was really important uh, to, to even the score, but not just vengeance. It was to try to show the world how the Brits had not only um, massacred all these people, but they covered it up. This is a huge, big cover up for 20 years. And he was um, going to make a point about it. Um, so I felt that the, um, the Indians who participated uh, as actors in the, in the, in the program and uh, in the movie and, and the people who you, you saw them conduct themselves, they were all, you know, elegant people. Um, they were 
they were really quite civilized um, and um, and it was tragic for that reason. But, but the Brits didn't see them that way. The Brits saw them as underclass, um, subservient, of, of no consequence. So therefore they could kill them, you know, without sanction, without thinking twice about it. And, you know, I had the impression that this was the biggest massacre that happened in that period of time, right after World War I, but there were others. And the Brits were doing that kind of thing to the Indians. That's the way they felt they could secure their colony. Um, that's the way they felt, as you said, as, as uh, O'Dwyer said to Sardar Udam and, and to the people at that, at that gathering where O'Dwyer spoke, and he spoke about this in clear terms. Um, you know, we, we have to subjugate them. We have to frighten them. Uh, that way we can hold on to our colony. It was a statement of British colonialism. Yeah. And if you thought about it and you looked at the massacre you saw in this movie, you saw the blood and gore of the massacre for sure. It was really a piece of work. And, uh, but, you know, what would you expect with those rifles and those big cartridges and all these unarmed people? What you They were torn apart. And the movie showed you that. And, you know, in, in the title of our little show here is The Long Shadow of That Massacre. It stuck with people. So if you want to do that to people you subjugate in a colony, you're going to lose the colony. Not right, not right away, but soon enough. And I think uh, it wasn't only Sadr Udam, who is a kind of revolutionary, making the point, you can't do that to us. We will not tolerate that. I think um, there were other incidents and other uprisings in India in those 20 years that made it clear to Britain this, there was no mileage in trying to hold on to this colony. That Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, he was, um, he believed in peaceful protest, right? And eventually they were, he was able to get India freed from British rule. But it wasn't only the British, a lot of the other colonial powers were also doing horrible things. I mean, if you know of the history of Haiti and how the, 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 the slaves up, uprising and, and, mass, and killed all the, the French overlords because the French overlords were brutal. It was, it was horrible what they were doing to the, to the, to the slaves, to the, to, the, you know, to the slaves in Haiti. So, I mean, the French, the, 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 the Dutch, this was pretty much typical colonials, as you mentioned, colonial way of operating, which was, so, I mean, this movie really sort of hit home, you know, it's, it's, it, the brutality was just unbelievable. And as you said, that seeing all those bodies and seeing Sardar Udam saving, trying to save these people, uh, hysterically working, you know, with that cart. All night long, all night long, oh. to the point of exhaustion, moving that cart back and forth through the, the, the uh, alleys and uh, small streets in, in that city to try to save just a few lives. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was thundering. It was uh, remarkable. But it's, it left a mark with him, and it took him 20 years. And, and as, as we alluded to, he wanted to do this where there would be a lot of world news. So he did this in London, right? Uh, in front of a, maybe a 200, 400 people. So it will be in the news. And then, then they tortured him too. They, they, he was going on a hunger strike and they force fed him, you know, uh, to, to open the tube down into his stomach to, to, to give him food because he wanted to have a, you know, and then finally he was executed. He had a good lawyer, but he was finally executed. But the British, you know, that was British justice, you know, and just like the other movie we saw with uh, Kate uh, Gunn, Kate Howard. Yeah, yeah no, uh, official secrets. Just the, the last time we had our show, we covered that. And, you know, I really wanted to make the comparison. And that was uh, later, you know, this, this happened in the late 30s, the assassination. By the way, in addition to uh, killing this uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor uh, O'Dwyer, um, he, he wounded a number of others who were uh, working for that guy who were part of his coterie. Um, so it wasn't limited to just O'Dwyer. But um, <clears throat> the point I make is that uh, to follow on your comment about how they, of course, he surrendered. He was right there. They grabbed him immediately and they took him to jail. And it was clear what he had done. 
And so the question is, how were they going to treat him? Well, you know, there was no humanity there at all. They just tortured him for the sake of it, because he was a revolutionary, um, because he had assassinated a, a, you know, a, a public official. Uh, they were just going to torture him until he, you know, was a wreck. And they went on for months torturing him. Um, is, is that the mark of a civilized country? Oh. You thought that that Britain, you know, who was trying to, you know, save itself from Germany and in World War One and World War Two, would be a civilized country. This was not civilized. Um, what they did to him. And by the way, you mentioned earlier, George, that in the in the 1919 period, uh, they were following him. Uh, there was a lot of um, intelligence gathering going on. There was a lot of there were a lot of intelligence officers arresting people in the middle of the night, breaking their doors down in, in India. Um, so the, the Brits who were the colonial power in India were awful right through that period between the two world wars. They weren't nice at all. Um, and it was war crimes, what they were doing. I mean, by the by the current definition, it's very ironic, you know, that they should be involved in Nuremberg um, after they themselves had been involved in these brutal massacres, um, unnecessary, without, without a good reason, um, and without any humanity whatsoever. And the connection, you know, between the, um, the, the British action uh, in uh, 1937 or thereabouts um, is really hard to, it's, it's hard to actually connect it with what happened uh, to Kate Gunn in Official Secrets. They arrested her. Um, they tried to throw her husband out of the country. And as I recall, he was Pakistani. He was yeah. not white. He was Kurt. He was a Kurd. Okay, okay. He was not white. He was clearly a Middle Eastern person. They they dumped on him. Uh, they held him in immigration, you know, Netherland, and then try to deport him. It was only through her political efforts that she was able to save him from a deportation, which would have been awful. They were married, but, and he was uh, either a permanent resident or a citizen of Britain. They just treated him terribly. Um, and they treated her terribly too, but nothing like him and nothing like the Indians. And what I get out of that, George, is that colonialism and what the British were doing through most of the 20th century was racist. Colonialism is racism. Get it? Yeah, and, and taking, taking all the produce from India and, and selling it, you know, like literally economically stripping the country of some of its resources and taking it to London and making money on it. So I couldn't agree. But bottom line is, here in America, our hands aren't clean. We've, we've done similar things, maybe not going out and actually massacring people. But I mean, if you oh, look oh, we've at, done that too. Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are times in American history, it's not hard to find yeah. where we did massacre and uh, cause the death and suffering of whole groups of people, usually on the basis of race. Native Americans, yeah, there, there you go. And then Iraq, this whole thing, you know, we talked about that with the other, um, you know, with the opera official secrets, you know, that whole thing about Iraq or the Iraqis that died, you know, so it's, it's like similar racism. It's, you know, it's, it's religious race, race, religious um, discrimination, you know, and looking down at people. And, and we're not, I mean, it's, I mean, they're in Muslim countries that look down at Christians and Jews as, as being expendable too, you know? So it's not, I mean, it's, it's, this is just, it's a superiority kind of thing, you know? And, and uh, the Brits, as you said, sitting at Nuremberg, what a joke. I'll leave it at that. Now, the Holocaust was certainly worse than, um, uh, what is it, uh, Yeah. I get that right, Jalianwala bag. Um, that, and, you know, it, it's hard to make a comparison, but it's that, it's that cold-blooded killing of civilians, women, children, unarmed, um, you know, for the sake of the atrocity. What um, happened and, to my, fa yeah, my family in Turkey, too, the same story. I mean, I don't want to do my personal thing, but that happened, too, in 1915, you know, 
600,000 to a million people getting just killed, civilians, not, not revolutionaries, just civilians, you know? So it, it's ubiquitous. It's a, any time you had a powerful empire, right, that want to subjugate and then they create fear and they kill people, you know? It's, it, so it's, it's like, it's not unique to the Brits. Let's put it that way. The German, yeah, but there's, there's two things that followed uh, Jelly and Wallabog. <clears throat> two things. One is the Brits didn't talk about it. They covered it up, and they, um, you know, they and tried to um, d disable, if you will, uh, neutralize anyone who might reveal what they did. Yeah. Um, and that's it's really important that we understand that because that seems to be the process. First, you have a massacre, however that gets organized, um, and then you don't speak about it and uh, cover it up. And then when somebody finds out what you did, ready, you deny it. That's right. And the United States is not um, unacquainted with this process. I mean, just a few days ago, um, after the United States, especially through the army, denied that civilians were killed in large numbers uh, in Syria, um, the New York Times did its own investigation and found, oh, yes, they were. And 70 or 80 of them were killed um, by American planes and bombs. <clears throat> there was one bomb that killed most of them. There was a second bomb that killed the rest of them. Uh, and we didn't know on either of those bombs. You know, what is that? Is that stupidity or is it more? And, the, and then there was the cover up. Uh, and Trump, um, you know, got up there and made all these statements about how we had won against ISIS. Well, you won against the Syrian civilians. That's what we won against. Exactly. So, you know, the, the problem is um, it's right here at home, too. But the lesson, let me, let me offer you a thought about the lesson, George. What saves us from being, you know, inhumane here? What saves us from the war crime aspect of this? Often it's not the government that conducted the massacre uh, or the military organization that kept it a secret or the officials that denied it once it got to be a public issue. It's the press. It's the New York Times. It's that kind of institution that reveals this exactly. and makes us know about it. And if we know about it, I mean, it's not gonna be a guarantee that it'll never happen again, but at least we know enough to know it was wrong and, and maybe it will affect things going forward. Maybe it will reduce the possibility of it happening again. What do you think about that? Y yes, and definitely to have an independent press that is going to report this stuff and Sardar Udam, because he where he assassinated o O'Dwyer, he wanted to, it to be in the press. So we need we need those independent uh, journalists to, to report this stuff. And that's the key here. Yeah. And what was your question again, Jay? Was it, you were related? You had a specific question. What was it again? Well, that was it. Yeah. Um, I just uh, wanted to know uh, what we what we take from this movie. Uh, just a uh, one point on this movie. It is pretty much true. It's a true story of what happened, and you have to give credit to the Indian film industry for covering this. This is not Bollywood. This is not a romance. This is not a happy story about you know life at home and and um, you know all the movies that we see. They make an enormous number of movies, thousands and thousands of movies every year. This is a new genre for India, I think. This is a, a genre which tells you a story the world needs to know about. Uh, for me, I, I did not know about this massacre. I did not know about Jolly and, Jolly and Wallabag. Uh, I did not know about Sadr Udam. Uh, and this was a real eye-opener for me on, on multiple levels about colonialism, about the character, the, the, the nature of the Indian character, um, about revolutions in colonial, colonial subjugations like this. 
about Britain. And it, it, it reinforces what we learned in, uh, in, in the official secrets movie. So it's like an education we're getting, George, don't you think? We ought to do more of these kinds of movies. Uh, it's troubling to know that there's not that many of them, but we can find them and we should review them, don't you think? Oh, yeah, because especially things that no, people don't know about, you know, uh, like this uh, massacre that, you know, in, in Amitsar, you know, that happened. But um, I'm, the, the Brits did other things. I mean, I, there, there's other instances of brutality uh, that, that we haven't, that we're really not aware of, you know, around the world, because they said that the, the sun never sets on the British Empire, you know, and, all, you know, they they had colonies all, all over the place. And so there were other, probably other other po possibilities with, uh, you know, um, there was uh, other brutalities uh, as well. Well, there are atrocities happening right now. I mean, in a number of countries, for example, in Africa, Think Tech has been covering them by talking to the African people that are on the ground. Um, and in those countries or from those countries, um, and, you know, they will tell you that things in terms of the atrocities, the, the coup d'etat, um, you know, the, the um, making making terrible experiences for the people um, are increasing now for reasons I don't fully understand. But one thing is um, the Atlantic published an article by Ann Applebaum a couple of days ago. Um, I don't know if you saw that. It was, it, it was somehow on this point. It was um, the story of how uh, authoritarian governments these days, autocrats in various countries with different ideologies, you know, Russia, China, their ideology is very different. Um, and some in South America, Venezuela, um, they admire each other and they learn from each other and they have a, a kind of club network with each other and they engage in uh, atrocities and that is increasing. And it's very troubling to know that they're kind of in a partnership to engage in atrocities and uh, have a war against democracy wherever it is. Um, we live in very difficult times, and those times are not limited to the United States, although the United States is a, a, it's an unhappy story right now. But uh, they're global. <clears throat> these, these are global events, and that's why it's important for us to study um, these stories, like Jelly, Jelly, uh, Jelly, and Wallam, Jelly and Wallabog, it's important for us to understand about violations of human rights and what what right-thinking people can do to limit Jelly and Wallabog. And then you know Donald Trump. I mean, he was he's an authoritarian, and he did things like he played played footsie or whatever with Putin and then Erdogan, you know, uh, to go into Syria and, and kill, uh, kill those Kurds, you know. So he was an authority. Then January 6th, he was, he's an authoritarian and he was on good terms with all these autocrats, you know, around the world. I mean, those were his buddies. So we got to look and it, it, there's issues going on right in our own country, right? And now Trump says he's going to run again, you know, and if he wins, he's never going to leave. You know, I mean, he'll probably find a way to stay in office for 12, 14 years or whatever. So we've got issues here. I mean, let's let's leave it at that. Yeah. And what's interesting, you know, to, to, to follow on that point just for a moment is that while he's friendly with um, um, Erdogan and Putin yeah. and some, in some strange way uh, with uh, Xi Jinping, and um, what's his name, Maduro, uh, in uh, South America? Yeah, right. Um, all these autocrats, he spent a lot of time and energy dumping on democracies, yeah. trying to undermine the, all the democracies in Europe, for example. Exactly, exactly. So, so where is that going? You know, I mean, this is, this is really, it's worse than we thought. He wasn't just being ignorant and, uh, you know, violating all the norms of... Uh, foreign relations uh, for this country, foreign affairs for this country. He was actually doing what Ann Applebaum has called him out for now. It's worth reading that article, George. It's in the Atlantic this week. I'll, I'll take a look at it. Yeah, thank you for, for alluding to that. George Kaysen, 
my movie reviewer person. I really enjoy these discussions with you, George. It's it's really valuable in in more, much more than just reviewing the movie. It's reviewing the movie against other movies. It's reviewing the movie against our life in these times in these United States and in the world. It's getting a handle, um, you know, on the reality. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Jay. Definitely, totally agree with you that there's other issues that are come into play. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. Okay.